OTB Gold is our series of the very best historic interviews from the last 18 years from Off the Ball from the archives. The interviews are currently airing on OTB Sports Radio, but in the next couple of weeks, we're going to release them for you to binge on on the OTB Podcast Network. So keep an eye out for OTB Gold. We'll publicise it across all of our social channels. But with a new two-part documentary on ESPN coming soon to whet your appetite, here's our own Lance Armstrong interview in full here on YouTube as a teaser of what's to come. If you enjoy this, get on to wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to all our podcast feeds. OTB Gold. All right, by now everybody knows the 1-0 con is on in Dublin in uh, just a couple of weeks' time and their main their main guest and main speaker is going to be Lance Armstrong and I'm delighted to say Lance Armstrong is with us now. Lance, how are you doing? Well, uh, good, thanks. I'm just, um, I'm here in Austin just kind of, uh, you know, living the life, raising my kids and exercising a little bit and uh, no complaints. Yeah, okay. Well, that's not a bad way to be, I guess. Um, what most people wanted me to ask you when we said you were coming on was, why are you coming to Dublin? Why are you doing interviews at the moment? Um, well, I mean, why not? I guess I would say. Uh, it, it, I've, I, I have done a few of these. I've spoken at a few campuses here in the U.S. I've done a few uh, more private gigs. Um, but they approached me and asked me to, to, I'm not, I wasn't totally familiar with, with the conference and what it is. I know that some of the other speakers, uh, who are there, guys like Jamie Fuller, I've, I've known for quite some time. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was, uh, seemed like an interesting opportunity and one that, uh, one that I, you know, look forward to doing. My my concern, I guess, with the conference and even with this interview a little bit is that you do have a very important ongoing case, which it seems might prevent you from answering some of the questions that I think ultimately are going to lead to a sense of closure for a lot of people. You know, I mean, every time I do a talk, I, I, I say to the room, look, I'm not, you know, I'm not here to bullshit you. I'm going to you ask the question. I'm going to answer the question. If if there happens to be a question that is too close and too sensitive to the federal case here in the United States, you know, I'm, I'm just going to tell you that I can't answer that question. Having said that, I've never not answered a question, right? So I've never had a question where I thought, oh my God, this is too sensitive. I just can't answer it. So it, it's, you know, that, that, that could be the case uh, in Dublin. But like I said, and I've done dozens of these uh, since that case was was opened, and I, I've never been put in a position where I thought, "Oh no, that's that's too sensitive or too close to that subject." How how close do you feel like you are to being free from the controversy? Because again, that was one of the other things that like there are a lot of people wondering about putting their hand in their pockets to buy a ticket for a conference, which ultimately is going to support you, where you're talking about your career, which obviously the seven tours, you don't technically have them anymore. You know, you're you're a doper. You've confessed to that. And people still have a, a difficulty with supporting somebody financially who won races while doping. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. I mean, I, I don't... I, I don't... Um... I don't question that. I don't fault them for that. That's that's a that's a process that that I'm living through, and and I guess as as we all live through, and and um, you know, like I, like I, I mean, I'll just reiterate: if if people are troubled by that or have a problem with it and don't want to come, then I I, I can't uh, you know fault them for that. So that's 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 the choice they'll get to make and and uh you know for the ones who who do come and i i, I think they'll be uh they'll, they'll be enough you know we'll have a good we'll have a good conversation I, it's the format is is interesting i like the i like opening with a with a basic interview or a basic moderator and then opening and then letting the floor ask the questions right so if we're there for 90 minutes letting that room ask questions for an hour like what's on your mind and Every every setting that I've done that in, you know, these you get some softballs, right, as, as can be expected. But you get some people that are generally really pissed off, and so that's you know those those aren't the easiest questions and answers. But uh, that's just part of it, man. This is not something that um, that people are going to forget about or people are going to move on from. People people want 
you know, whether it's an apology or whether it's a direct answer or whether it's some contrition, whatever it is. And so that's, you know, I welcome those opportunities and um, that's just, <laughs> that's the spot I've got myself in. So, well, let, let's talk a bit about that because the apologies have been forthcoming, and, and I think everybody has seen you. You talk about that, and you know you, you're on the record as saying, well, "I don't know what people want. That maybe they want me to to apologize forever. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but maybe that's a good thing." I guess really most of our Western civilization is built on the notion that if you sin, you must redeem yourself. There must be an atonement made. There must be some sense of of justice restored. And I'm wondering. Maybe that's the bit of your story that we haven't actually seen yet. So we've seen the apologies. But for example, I'm not really sure what you've done to help cycling since your ban. I'm not really sure what you've done to help anti-doping since your ban. I don't really know what the status of your relationship with a bunch of other people who were key figures in your downfall. The Andreus, the Le Mans, Kimmage, for example. It's, it's restitution to those people that I think will actually lead to people coming to these events and going, OK, Lance has paid for what he did. Right. So so that's a loaded question. So just go one by one there. Let's start at the beginning. Have you atoned to cycling? You know, that's that's a it's very different. I am I am not not only am I banned from the sport, but there there is whether whether it's through riders, whether it's through teams and events, I mean not only uh, I mean it's very difficult to have any impact there right i'm not i'm not welcome there i'm persona non grata it's it's that's that one probably will never happen just because i'm simply you know i'm never there i have no people ask me about cycling all the time and i say i say i have no idea i mean i'm the i'm the last person that would know what's going on I guess with that, so Jamie Fuller thinks that you've got a role to play in the future of cycling because obviously you understand exactly but I, but, what the, what the yeah, architecture. Just, go on. Yeah, I just I want to finish out what you said earlier, so I want to go one by one. I wanted to answer your initial question. Yeah, I, okay. think, I think it's a good question. Okay, well, I I do think that you have a role to play in cycling if you atone to them, and the way that I would suggest that you atone to them is kind of the answer to the anti-doping question, and that's by having a full frank disclosure. And I know in the past you said that you would disclose everything if it was going to be at an international uh, truth and reconciliation situation. That doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. And maybe you could be the catalyst for that by saying, this is how I doped, this is when I doped, this was the procedures that I used, this was the money that it cost me, this was the access that I had to Michele Ferrari, right. and these are the doctors that helped right. me. Right. So, so I don't know if you recall or not, but Brian Cookson, when he became the president of the UCI, he... He invested several million dollars in what was called the CIRC report, uh, the CIRC report. Uh, I testified multiple times, probably more than anybody else, for that commission. Now, most people forget that the CIRC report even happened because it kind of came and went, and it was largely panned uh, the world over. But I was the first person in the door. I was completely transparent. I testified multiple times. And not only did I do that, but I've, I've testified multiple times in private to USADA. And so, uh, you know, people don't know those things. People don't talk about those things. Maybe they don't want to know. Maybe they don't want to talk about them. Well, would you, would you but, talk about them, though? Would you tell us what you said to USADA? Or, like, why, why does that need to be private? Because ultimately, at this point, I don't know who would be protected. It seems like the, the, the statute of limitations would apply to all the stuff anyway from 2006 and, and back in, in most cases. And I think yeah. most cycling fans now would really be interested in the mechanics of the doping, the, how often it happens. Like what we've heard so far is what Floyd tells us and what Tyler Hamilton tells us. But like your relationship with Michele Ferrari is fascinating. How that happens, the, the, the sense of joy that the two of you must have felt when you came together and realized that you'd found a kindred spirit. <laughs> well, I, I don't know that that would be a, 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 a perfect analysis or description of it, but I want I want to finish again. I want to keep going back and finishing the first set of questions you had. Okay, okay. Well, you, I'll, you I'll, talked about atonement with cycling. You talked about atonement with anti-doping. I, I hope that I answered those questions. And and then you talked about atonement and restitution with others. Yeah. So Betsy Andreu. I've apologized multiple times. The the apology hasn't really worked. She's she's <laughs> right, but Garrett, Garrett, here's the thing. You're a big boy. I'm a big boy. She's a big girl. 
we're all we're all adults here. You can either accept the what I've learned, and and you can't for, you can't force somebody to an ex, to accept an apology, right? So whether it's the Andreos, whether it's Oman's, whether it's M. O'Reilly, whether it's uh, Christophe Bassons, I've traveled the world to make to make it right with these people. I have sat in those settings with Simeone, with Bassons, with M. O'Reilly. I sat with Greg and Kathy Lamont in San Francisco for half a day, um, and so. I don't know, and not only that I sit there, but I meant it, right? So I don't know what else I need to do. Well, I guess so. Uh, let's take that. Most of the people, most let's... of the people in these in these positions, have accepted the apology and moved on with life. So the Lamont, yeah. the Lamonts haven't, and the Andreas haven't, right? The the Lamonts, um, I, I, a person with knowledge of the situation told me that you did indeed meet them for four hours, and their report, my my source was that your primary goal was to have a press release signed to say that you'd made up with Greg, but the reality is that you didn't actually apologize and never offered to make amends with the Le Mans. Instead, that you claimed during the meeting that you got caught up in the moment. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who told you that. that that's absolutely not true. And, 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 and furthermore, I'll repeat, uh, I did apologize to them right away and i meant it and 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 furthermore on top of that because i know that that they were concerned about the impact that it had on their children i offered to travel wherever i needed to travel to sit with their own children and say hey i am sorry about this and um, i hope you forgive me i understand if you don't but what you just described i don't know who told you that is absolutely untrue and you know of course you don't have to believe me, and I don't have to believe you. I, I don't have any credibility with, 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 with these situations, but that is simply not true. Okay. The, the point about the Le Mans, I suppose, is the, the, for people who are maybe unfamiliar with the story, in your deposition in the SCA case in 2006, you said that Greg had a, a, an alcohol and drug problem, and ultimately Trek chooses you over him and a $20 million a year revenue business disappears from the Le Mans life. So did you ever think about making financial restitution to the Le Mans? So you want, so I need to make financial restitution because I had nothing to do with Trek's decision to do that. Really? Hello? Yeah, we're still here. Really? <laughs> Absolutely not. Okay, because it seems, it seems weird that they turn their back on uh, an American cycling hero like Greg LeMond without their star performer, you, who, who is on the verge of making them billions, granted. But you, sure. had, you had no input? No. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm answering your question. I mean, you don't have to believe me. I, I, I answered the question. If you want me to say it another way, so that you're happy. No, I don't. I'm, then I, I will. I, I, we we understand exactly what you're saying. There's there's no there's no communication issues there. You did go after Greg Lamond after he said in that interview with David Walsh that if you were doping, it was the greatest fraud in history. That that that, that scene, I think, where you're actually reading the paper is in the Alex Gibney movie. So there was a a, a personal sense of anger towards him, which maybe leads to you know, some of the, the language that you use. You don't think you need to make financial restitution, obviously. That's that's clear. No, I, I don't think I do. And and here's the thing, Gary, is I sat in that room, not only with Greg and Kathy, I sat in that room with with his lawyer and with my lawyer, and there were plenty of other people in that room, and, and I apologize to them. Nope, and never at any time did Greg and or Kathy say, hey, we feel like you owe us financially, right? There were... And I don't need to get into the to the details of the conversation. The most important part was that I was uh, I was sorry for my actions. I was embarrassed by my actions, and I apologized to them. And they accepted the apology. Okay, I don't think they and, did accept the apology. It seems that's certainly <laughs> you weren't in the room. What are you talking about? Well, I've got pretty good sources. Oh, okay, okay, Superman. So then, what else? Okay, so let's move on to the Andreas then. We'll, we'll leave the Le Mans and, and maybe we'll reach out to them and see if they, they want to comment on this afterwards. So with Betsy, I guess it all stems from the hospital room in 1996 and the fact that she testified against you in 2006, Frankie testified against you. 
There's also now an audio recording of, uh, I think it's um, an Oakley employee in the room who calls Greg LeMond. This is in the, the BBC Four film. And she says that if subpoenaed by LeMond's lawyers, if there was ever a case against you, that she would also testify that what she had heard in the room was what Betsy reported was in the room. To this day still, you say, actually, uh, I don't, I, I can't remember what was said in the room. Is that still your situation with Betsy? Uh, that is still my, that, that my, my, I don't have a recollection of that conversation. And if, if it, it's, it's a little, I mean, this is where, where, and this is perhaps where, where Betsy and I can never reconcile. Um, she has a, she has a strong memory of it. I do not have a strong memory of it. I, I think it's, I think it's highly improbable that at that moment in, in a patient's uh, treatment process that a doctor would come in and have an open conversation about that in front of uh, a bunch of strangers to him and or her. And so just because of medical privacy laws and HIPAA laws, and all of the things that are, that are firmly in place, doctors just don't do that. But, but that's neither here nor there. What, what, we all know what happened. If I don't have a recollection of it and she does, I'm, I'm sorry for the way that I treated the Andreas. I have said that. And, you know, to me, I mean, I, I would love for at some point for them to accept my apology. But, you know what, some, some people just aren't in that place and, and may never be. When her name came up in your podcast recently with the interview that you were doing with um, the is it Ben Foster, the actor who, who played you in the, the program, that movie, um, you, you said... I, there was like a pause when he asked you the question. I don't know the specific wording of the question, but it was basically suggesting that maybe there was something, there was some underlying motive in in how she was um, defending her family that went beyond defending her family. And you went, uh, "Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned." It doesn't really sound like you're making amends to a woman when that's you know a pretty terrible thing to say about her. No, and I, and I and you didn't. I don't know if you just listened to. 30 seconds of it, I said, listen, I want to be very respectful. Of, I, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I don't want to, I don't want to, to create more of an issue with that family. And so I, I don't know if you've missed that part. I heard that. I heard uh, the whole thing. Yeah, it was, a, it was a really interesting interview. Good. Glad you liked it. But uh, it did seem kind of, you know, there was a, there was a gap there. I don't know. It just didn't seem like that was, it seemed like you still have something against Betsy that you're still, you know, you weren't like, no, 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 no. Hang on a second. I'm going to stop that right there. It was more like, whoa, we're not going there. And then there's room for people to fill in that gap of about 30 seconds before you get to that. I want to be very respectful. But anyway, maybe we should move on from this because like I, I did speak to Betsy in advance of this and, and she said that uh, I can say on the record, Lance has not made amends. I don't want anything from him other than for him to stop lying about me when he was smearing me. Very few in the media contacted me. So I just wanted to put that side of it out there. Michele Ferrari, let's talk a bit, a bit about that because you, you put him in the Alex Gimney movie. And I was astonished by that because at that stage, Michele Ferrari is one of the world's most recognized <laughs> doping doctors. He's had a conviction. Granted, it's been overturned. But the world and his wife knows that Ferrari is dodgy and you let Alex Gibney go and interview him and see all the stuff that's there and, you know, show some of the science that you guys are working on. What was your motivation in sharing Ferrari with Gibney? Uh, I mean, Alex, Alex Gibney was in charge of that project. So that was not, if, if, if Alex wanted to talk to Ferrari, then that was done on his own. You'd have to ask, ask Alex about that. You didn't nix it, though. You didn't say, no, hang on a second. You can't do that. No. I mean, you'd have to ask. Alex is, is I think, more independent than that, and, and I don't think that he would have. I don't think that's the way he operates. Ferrari, though, obviously, you know, you paid million a million dollars to Ferrari over the years. You could have said, listen, please don't talk to this guy. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess I could have. So why didn't you? Why didn't I say what? Don't speak to Gibney. Don't 
do anything here, Michele. This could this is a house of cards. It's going to come tumbling down, and it's going to bring you and me and everybody we know down with it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I wasn't I, at that point. I wasn't that involved, and I wasn't that worried about. I knew that that this was all going to be out, whether it's via documentaries or books or or cases with testimony, depositions, etc. Okay. Did Michele Ferrari ever offer to supply you with a motor for your bike? <laughs> Absolutely not. And did you ever consider using a motor for your bike? Of course not. Well, it, this is interesting, right? Because it's degrees of like, what's the difference between using the best EPO and using a motor? I'm, I'm kind of interested because we're hearing that the, the motors and mechanical doping is something that there's a big story brewing, something's going to break. And, you know, it would be very interesting to hear, like you were... You guys were the best and you were determined to, to win from 99 onwards. And it's around this time we think that the um, the Hungarian inventor starts to offer people stuff. And if I was if I was in possession of a motor, the first person I would go to would be you and say, here, listen, what do you think? Okay. And your point? Did you ever use a motor? Absolutely. I just told you, absolutely not. And there's a, as a matter of interest, Why? Like, what's the difference between doing that and taking EPO? We, Gary, what are you? Are you a complete rookie? What are you? Ta- I mean, that in nineteen ninety nine, nobody even knew you could put a motors were for motorcycles. What, what are you? I mean, are you out of your mind? No, I, I like. Well, look, <laughs> the the. I mean, honest, seriously, seriously. I mean, first of all, I know I know that that's topical. I know that there has been a rider caught with a motorcycle. Or with a motor in their bike, but what? I mean, are you crazy? Uh, no, I'm just I'm just talking to people who are saying that there's a, a big story about motors coming, and I'm interested to to get your perspective on it and see if anybody ever offered you one. But obviously, right? And I answered that, and the answer is no. Okay, okay, okay. You you said that that nobody ever offered you one. Uh, I mentioned Kimmage earlier as the the Kimmage and, and Walsh and the the list of people that maybe you could make amends or atone to. Kimmage, obviously, you tweeted him saying that he should do the interview at one zero con. He said no because obviously a former another journalist had already been booked for that, which would have been very bad form from his perspective. He uh, he followed up with a, a a tweet in public DM question mark. I presume that the DM was a, uh, why don't we just have an interview without an audience? Will you grant him that interview without an audience? Yeah, again, you know, Paul's an interesting case because I, I don't, I mean, I had one interaction with Paul and that was at the press conference in California. I didn't handle it right. I mean, I'd love to, to whether it's in an interview or over a beer or whatever, I'd sit with Paul anytime. Hey, my bad. I'm sorry. That, that was a complete dickhead. Um, you know, the the tone of his direct messages. To, I mean, they're, they're they're private messages. I don't know if he feels like I'd be violating any sort of code there if I reveal those. But yes, he he wants to do an interview. I feel like it's he doesn't. He's not a fan of of the one zero con. He's not a fan of the organizers. Um, but I don't think it's fair to them to to to, to get in the middle of that. I, I think there's a time and a place for he and I to sit down. Um, but I, truth be told, I don't know Paul Cambridge. I don't have anything against Paul Cambridge. So, I mean, I had, again, there was that one interaction, which I'll fully cop to and confess to that, that I was out of line. But shit, other than that, I'm happy to sit down with him at some point. What about David Walsh? Da- David, you, you, you talk about making amends. I mean, some of these things... You either make personal amends, you make financial amends. Um, David's David's situation has been settled, and it's it's a confidential matter, and, and I can't I can't comment on that. He he can't comment on that. Um, but so you know. yeah, so we're never gonna. It's unlikely, given that confidentiality, that we're ever gonna see an interview between you two at some point in the future, or maybe you know you might stick them on your podcast. I don't, that would be an interesting podcast, actually, but I don't, I don't, I don't know that that's going to happen anytime soon. Would you put Ferrari on your podcast and, and go through the details of of what you guys did together? You know, you know, do you know the name of the podcast? The Forward. Forward. Right. So the Forward is really it's it's it, it's Forward, and so going back and talking about doping in the '90s and talking about doping in the 
early 2000s, that's not forward. And, and, and I know that, that that probably doesn't sit well with you or others, and, and that's okay. You can, you can choose not to listen, but it's a forward podcast, and it's, and it's my podcast, and it's going to be <laughs> people in, in, in subjects that, that I think are interesting, but I'm not gonna, it's not the reverse podcast. I do think that there's a big chance for you to step forward and play a role with anti-doping and, and have a, a credibility with the audience as somebody who has been through this. But there is still that sense that we don't know exactly what happened and we don't really know the true character. Like, I wonder, on the podcast, in various stages, you've here, said... Here, that, here, 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 hang on a second. I, I told you at the top of the show here that any time... If, and, and when I say authorities, right, so the, the, the UCI with the CERC report, USADA, anytime they've wanted to sit down and talk, I have talked. Is it more than twice so, with USADA? Because we heard there was the first one, and then there was the, the second one with Travis, which was about a year ago. Have there been more times since? No. So it's twice, it's twice with USADA. Yeah, twice with CERC and twice with USADA. Okay. And so that's, I don't know. I mean, what, 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 well, I, what, what I, more can I do? That I mean, I guess I tell you pretty... what. I tell you what we want to know. We want to be able to believe in cycling, so that we we know that in the past team owners have colluded with the organizing uh, body and with the star cyclist, and this is how that collusion works. And actually, everybody's as responsible for that as the star cyclist. And I think that actually it would help to implicate the sport and your role in the sport. And actually, maybe ease a little bit of the pressure if you also said, well, yeah, okay, so this is how this whole thing worked. When the sponsors wanted to turn a blind eye, they turned a blind eye. When the race organizers wanted to turn a blind eye, here's how we managed that. When the governing body wanted to turn a blind eye, here's how we did that. And those bits and pieces have been dragged into the light by the books and by some of the documentaries. And it was really interesting to me to hear that you haven't read that many of the books and you didn't watch the movies until you watch the program because you were interviewing the star of it. And so I'm not really sure if you know exactly what's out there, but if you were to sit down and tell everybody over a short period of time, it's done, it's over, and then we can all begin to move on. But at the moment, we all feel like, actually, I don't know what the truth is. I don't know how this whole system works. Hmm. Yeah. You don't buy that. Um. Well, outside of sitting down with the authorities and telling them everything I know, you know, what what the, what the governing body decides to do with it, I mean, we saw what they decided to do with it, right? The report comes out, and the, like I said, it was pan. Um, so whether or not that collusion with riders and teams and sponsors and the governing body exists today, I have no idea. I guess it's the, the architecture of how it existed in the past that would be interesting to help prevent it in the future. But okay, so we, we've covered that. There's one last thing I wanted. If you haven't read the books and you haven't seen the, the movies, you're not entirely sure how you're portrayed in them. I guess you've, you've a fair idea, but at various stages in them, people refer to you as a pathological liar. And in one case, there's a guy says uh, after the deposition in, in 2006, either all the scientists were wrong or this guy's a psychopath. And I'm wondering when you read that and you see the reports and when people come back to you and say, this is what these guys have said about you, do you recognize yourself? Um, I mean, I was definitely stuck in a pattern there of not being truthful and, 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 the, and the, the brazenness of that, the denials and the defenses. I mean, it's embarrassing. I mean, I, 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 I am reminded of that from time to time. And I, I don't like that. And so, but the good news is, is look, I get to come to Dublin. I get to sit there for 90 minutes. If I had done it five years ago, I would have bullshitted you the entire time. And so I get to sit there and just just say it the way it is. And some will be happy. Some will not be happy. Some For some, it won't be enough. For some, it will be too much. And, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, if you think I roll around every day and worry about, well, they called you. About, I, I'm not going to worry about that, right? I'm going to live my life um, head high and heart full and be as honest and as transparent as I can going forward. And, again, we're all in process here, right? So some people, they'll be okay with that. Some people will say, no, that's that's not good enough, and it never will be good enough. And I understand that. I understand it, man, and and, and 
that's just that's just the walk that I have to walk. Okay, two, we've got to go. I understand that. Two final quick questions. Where are, you, where are your jerseys? Are they up in your house on display at the moment? Absolutely. And and because Johan still has the manager of seven times Tour de France in his Twitter bio, could we expect to see to come back to yours at some point? Uh, I don't know. Listen, it, it, it's it's that that's a fascinating question. And I mean, look, it's like when George. Let me just give you an example. When George Hincapie goes to an event and is announced, right? They introduce him, right? They say. George Hincapie, who rode on nine Tour de France winning teams. And nobody questions that. Everybody claps and says, that's great. Right? So the seven for me, one for Contador, and one for Cadell Evans. No, nobody says anything. But if I were to go to an event and announce myself as a seven-time Tour de France winner, pe- people would lose their shit, right? So it's it's a bit hypocritical, Um but the, but the event is too great and too grand to not have a winner, right? So that's that's where I always get to. Like, you you clearly have an opinion. Your listeners have an opinion. I don't know what those opinions are, but the, my peers have an opinion about it too, right? So I don't know. It's it's a it's a tough one that I think will take fifty or a hundred years to sort out. What do you think of the Bradley Wiggins stuff? Nah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not surprised by that. But I mean, he was theoretically he was within the rules. So that, that, that's there's not much we can do about that. And marginal gains, having been through what you went through to win your tours, do you believe in marginal gains in Sky? Again, like I told you at the beginning of the show, I mean, I, I people ask me all the time about this stuff, and I. I'd love to answer the question, but I'm so detached from the sport. Like nobody, nobody in the sport of cycling is going to talk to me, right? If they know something, if they want to share, they, they don't come to me. About, I'm the last person that anybody in cycling is going to talk to about that stuff. So I, I mean, I, man, I'd love to give you an answer, but I don't, I don't have the answer. Lance Armstrong, great having you on the show tonight. Thanks a million. OTB Gold. The very best of off the ball. This is OTB Sports Radio.